On this Memorial Day weekend, we want to recognize and honor and show appreciation to those who are serving or have served in our U.S. military. So if that's you today, would you stand and remain standing so that we can recognize and show honor to you and appreciation. I want to ask that you all stay standing and we're going to pray. Let's pray for these and let's pray for our nation. Father, today we come to you in the name of Jesus, thanking you for this country that we live in, for so many, God, who have served and given their time and, and put their life in harm's way to protect us and to bring freedom and to keep freedom in our nation. Father, I pray today for each and every person that's standing in this place, for those, God, who have family members who are serving in the military, who may be deployed and, and, and away from their families. God, I pray that you administer minister to them and to their families, God, that you would just bring your peace and your presence. Guard and protect, keep in safe uh, uh, those who are, who are serving today. And thank you, God, for those who have given and served this nation. Father, we pray for our leaders. We pray for our president, our vice president. We pray for our Congress and all of our military. We just lift them up to you today and pray your, your um, touch, your power, your leading, your Holy Spirit power upon them. We pray for America, that you'd pour your spirit out here. Bless this nation. Draw us back to you, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand, and we're going to uh, do a pledge of allegiance to the flag. Would you join me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. You can be seated. Thankful to live in America. And you might be questioning the way things look in our world today, and I think that we all ought to be concerned with how things are going in our world, and we need to pray. We need to pray for our leaders, and we need to be salt and light wherever we go. It's an opportunity for the church to rise up and be the church. So this morning, I'm excited to be able to bring this message. It's the last in our series on the Holy Spirit, certainly not comprehensive in any way. I feel like what we've done is just kind of scratch the surface a little bit to talk about who the Holy Spirit is, what his role, what his purpose uh, in our lives and for our lives. And so we've just gotten a little bit of a big picture uh, view of Holy Spirit. And as we continue uh, in our teachings and in other areas, we continue to grow in and learn more about the Holy Spirit. So for some... This has been review. It's kind of been a, a renewing uh, just to talk about, a reminding of the refreshing of who Holy Spirit is and what he does in our lives. And for some of our congregation who maybe come from some different backgrounds where the Holy Spirit teaching is a little bit different, uh, this is something completely new and maybe re uh, a revelation to you. I, I mentioned a few weeks ago, just in starting this series, a lot of Christian churches avoid talking about the Holy Spirit. Uh, because they just haven't studied, they haven't understood, they haven't experienced his presence and his purpose and his role in the life of a believer. For a lot of people, the Holy Spirit uh, is kind of like a crazy step uncle. You know, he's okay if he's just kind of over in his corner where we can kind of keep an eye on him, but we don't want him to get out of control. We're okay with God the Father, Jesus the Son, but the Holy Spirit. A lot of Christians don't, it's like we, we know there's a Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We just don't want him to uh, kind of get out of control. So we kind of keep him under, under wraps. But here's the deal. We're Christians. We're followers of Jesus. We're believers in God. We're believers in a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. At Jesus' baptism, and there's several scriptures throughout the Bible that give a picture of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit just in one verse. But you can look in Luke chapter 3 in Jesus' baptism. John was in the water with Jesus, and it says this, that as he began to pray, uh, the Holy Spirit came in bodily form like a dove landing on Jesus. And there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. In one verse, we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together. They're all important. And so we're talking about the Holy Spirit, and uh, I believe that we need to be reminded of who he is. Remind, 
remind, a, just a reminder that uh, Bethlehem is God with us, Emmanuel, Jesus, born of a virgin. He is God with us. At Calvary, we have God for us, Jesus dying in our place, taking our penalty, our punishment upon himself so that we could be forgiven and set free. That's Calvary. And at Pentecost, it is God in us the promised gift of the Holy Spirit that came. And Jesus said, as he promised the the Holy Spirit, not only will he be with you, he will be in you. John 16, seven, very truly I tell you, Jesus said, it is for your good that I am going away. This is before he ascended into heaven. He's talking to his disciples. And he said, unless I go away, the advocate will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, a helper, a comforter, the Holy Spirit, to help you, to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but Jesus said to his disciples, you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. He talked about the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit and when he ascended into heaven, he would send, the Father would send the Holy Spirit, not just to be with them, but to live in them. So we at New Hope, we're an Assemblies of God church and uh, we, are, we are Pentecostal. You may have no idea what that means. The word Pentecost is a Greek word that simply means 50. I don't know why people are afraid of a word like that, and I don't saying that you should be afraid. You shouldn't be. It's it's just a word. It, uh, Pentecost uh, is one of the three pilgrimage festivals in the Jewish uh, calendar, known as also the Feast of Weeks, which happens 50 days after the Feast of Passover, and so. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we read about and we have read about in Acts chapter 2 happened on this day, the day of Pentecost. And that's where we get this distinction of, of Pentecostal. Because the experience, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that happened on the day of Pentecost uh, and, the, and the events that took place in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the gifts, we refer to that as the, those Pentecostal things. So we believe in uh, the events of that day and the, the gifts that were poured out through the Holy Spirit uh, on the early church. And that is for us today. There's never been a place where that ceased to happen. God gave the Holy Spirit for the church to move forward. So Pentecostals are the fastest growing faith group in the world. I don't know if you knew that. Worldwide, our population is growing at a rate of 1.2%. That's the, that's the birth rate, 1.2%, the uh, grow, growth rate. Christianity is growing at a rate of 1.27%. So we're a little bit ahead of that curve. Islam, however, one95 They're growing much faster. The Sikhs at 1.66. Hindus, 1.3. Pentecostal Christians worldwide, 2.26. So they are a a growing group of people. Um, If you have any kind of history or or, uh, idea of Pentecostal people, Pentecostal churches, there is a stereotype from years ago where Pentecostal people would be those that are from the wrong side of the tracks. There the, they're, they're are the uh, loud people, the tongue talkers, um, the uh, holy rollers, the flag wavers, the uh, snake handlers. They're the, they're the crazy Christians. That's the stereotype of, of Pentecostal people, Pentecostal Christians. But there are some distinctive characteristics that describe uh, the church, the Pentecostal churches and Christians uh, in, in our world. And this is, this is what we believe as a church. We believe in the authority of Scripture. We believe that it is a standard for our faith and conduct. We believe in the whole Bible. You've heard the term full gospel. We believe it all. We believe it's all for today. We believe in purity and living a holy lifestyle, in prayer, power, the power of the Holy Spirit through Holy Spirit gifts that are given to us, spiritual language, speaking in tongues. There there has a purpose and a place in our lives. Signs and wonders, healing, salvation, salvation being a radical, life-changing event. Not just a prayer that you pray, but God changes your life. It's an experience where our life is never the same. Evangelism and missions are what what marks our our movement, our tradition. And so as we wrap up this series, I've entitled the message today, A Holy Spirit Church. And I want to ask this question, what kind of church are we going to be? What kind of church is New Hope going to be going forward? Are we going to be uh, an average church 
or are we going to be a normal church? And you're saying, what kind of choices are those? Listen, the world is changing around us. You, you've, you've recognized and you know that that's the case, right? The world is changing. We're seeing drastic changes around our world in values and morals and different things like that. And I'm afraid that the church is changing right along with the world. So if we look at what's the difference between the average church and a normal church, um, I believe that that is answered by looking at the first church, the early church. Acts chapter two, if you wanna turn in your Bibles there, we're just gonna get a, get a glimpse of that early church. A few verses of, of scripture in Acts chapter two and Acts chapter four. Before Jesus ascended back to heaven, at the end of his life here, he was, he was crucified, he was resurrected, and he was here for, for several days, and he ascended back into heaven. And this is what he told his disciples. He said, wait here in Jerusalem for the gift that my Father is going to send, the Holy Spirit. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, Acts 1, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. To put that in our local terms, you will be witnesses. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses in Urbandale and Des Moines and Iowa and the United States and the uttermost parts of the world. Acts chapter 2, we'll see the difference of what the average church of our day and the normal church that we read about right here. This is the first church, Acts chapter 2, um, starting with verse 42. It says this about the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All of the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so what we see in this first church, this early church, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people were added to their numbers. And this is the church that's beginning to happen. And this is what's going on in their midst. What we see is that of the teaching of the apostles, they, they're teaching, they're, there's prayer that marks their, their church, ministry, fellowship, evangelism, all those things. Acts chapter 3 Starts with uh, Peter and John, and they're, they're walking into the city. They go through the gate called Beautiful, and there's a guy who's been begging. This guy has been lame from the time of birth. He's never known what it's like to, to walk. And his, his lot in life was to beg at the city. And so as they're coming in, I know that they knew this guy was going to be sitting there. And he's asking for money. And uh, Peter engages him, and he says, hey, man, look at us. And so he looks at Peter, and I know what he's expecting Peter to hand him some money, because that's, that's what his job is. He's just begging for money. And Peter responds by saying, you look at us. We don't have silver, we don't have gold. But what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Walk. And it says that Peter bent down, took his hand, and helped the man up. And instantly his legs and his ankles became strong. And the Bible says that he went walking, leaping, and praising God. You talk about an experience of what God can do. He didn't have any money. He said, but I'll give you what I do have. Wouldn't that be amazing for us to, to, to extend to others what we have experienced through the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in our lives? They went walking, leaping, praising God. Well, uh, the religious leaders didn't like that. And so Peter and John were brought before them, and they basically said, look, okay, we can't have any of this anymore. It's causing problems. People are, people are getting excited. Don't go healing people. We don't, we, 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 things are getting out of control. And they basically said, no longer speak in the name of Jesus. We don't want, we don't want any of that anymore. You guys be quiet. They couldn't, they, couldn't, um, they couldn't punish them. They couldn't do anything because here's a crowd of people who are giving praise to God because a man who had been lame from birth now is healed. People are excited. And so they, they basically tell them no more. And it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 18, they called the apostles back in, commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied to these religious leaders, do you think God wants to obey you rather than him? 
We cannot stop telling about everything that we have seen and heard. Listen, we've seen, we've heard miraculous things and we're not gonna shut up. We're obeying God, we're not obeying you. That's what they said. I will. So they release him and tell him to go home, no longer talk, even though they said, we're not, we're not doing that. So here's, here's the response. Verse 23, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers, and they told them what the leading priests and elders had said. And when they heard the report, when they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. And now, O oh Lord, they said, hear their threats, what they have threatened to do to us. And give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they preached the word of God with boldness. This is what you do. Tell them to be quiet. Eh. What's going to happen when when you're told you you can no longer talk about Jesus? You can no longer share your faith with anybody. What are you going to do? Okay. No. We can't help but tell about what we've seen and heard. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. And what does a witness tell? What they've seen and what they've heard. That's all you have to do as a witness. This is what I saw. This is what I heard. I'm just telling you what I saw and heard. It's not hard to do that. And if God is doing something in our midst, God's doing something in your life, it's not hard to tell what he's doing. This is all I know. Talk about the man who was healed in John chapter 9 of blindness. All I know is he spit in some dirt, he put mud in my eyes, told me to go wash, and now I see. What I've seen and what I've heard. they, They brought him and said, how did he do this? Who did this? Who do you think he is? Who are you? You're not the guy that was blind. Yes, I am. No, you're not. It was the craziest conversation. All he's saying is, this is, this is what I've seen, this is what I've heard. Going on in verse 32, all the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had in common. The apostles testified powerly to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all, and there were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles and give to those in need. So here is a list of characteristics that would describe this early church. As we read through those verses, uh, they, were, they, they experienced discipleship, daily fellowship, prayer, relationships, generosity, growth spiritually and numerically. They were witnesses. They were bold. There were signs and wonders, miracles, healing. There was unity. There was boldness in preaching. And there was powerful witnessing. All that happened because of what the Holy Spirit was doing. Do you want to be a normal church or do you want to be the average church? I want us to be normal. And this is normal. This is who we are. This is who the Holy Spirit wants us to be. This church does an amazing job. But listen, we have got so much room to grow. You're a generous church and you're giving, bringing God's tithes and offerings and missions. Praise God for what he's doing. 250,000 that was given in the month of April for missions. That's amazing. But that's, listen, that's because of the Holy Spirit, what he's done in and through your life. You are like a, a channel. We're not, just, we're not just a tank where we hold it all to ourselves, but you give and the Holy Spirit and the God just keeps giving back to us so we, that we can give. You're an amazing church. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. If you've got giving today, there's a lot of ways that you can do that. I don't think we announced that earlier. You can give online, newhope.church slash give. If you're watching online, that's a way that you can give. If you're here in the place, you can uh, drop them in the giving boxes on your way up. But I just want to say thank you for being an amazing church. Would you just join me for a moment? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have blessed us beyond measure. And I thank you, God, for the faithfulness of your spirit at work in our life, God, to provide for us and to learn that as we give, God, you just keep giving back to us. As we give, Lord, in so many ways in serving, God, you, you give back to us. Us. And I thank you that this church is catching and caught the vision for that. And I just pray that you would continue to pour our, your spirit out on us. God, change our hearts, change our, our perspective. And Lord, may we be fully in on who you are and what you want to do in and through our lives. Thank you for this church. God, may we be all that you designed for us to be in the days to come. God, we don't want to be the average church. We want to be the normal church. 
In Jesus' name, amen. A spirit-filled church is a, is, a, is a normal experience for the church in Acts. And it should be the normal experience for every church in the world moving forward. Spirit-filled church composed of spirit-filled believers. So as you look around at the average church in the world around us in America, and I'm not saying we're comparing ourselves to each other, but you come to the conclusion, do we want to be average? Do we want to look like the early church? The biblical example of what a church should be. We could ask a question like this, are we going to be a container where we hold it all in, or are we going to be a channel for his spirit to, to flow through? Are we going to be a reservoir? where we're holding everything and all of our resources, or are we gonna be a, a river, letting him and his spirit uh, and his resources flowing through us? How we answer those questions is, is what determines our future as a church. Jesus said this in John seven thirty seven. He said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom it, those who had believed in him were later to receive, up to that time the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So we're getting a foretaste of what would happen in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit coming. He said, you will receive, you will, it will be like rivers of living water flowing through you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We often make things so complicated, but Jesus always keeps it very simple. Jesus keeps it very simple. Jesus is looking for thirsty people. He's looking for thirsty churches. And my question to you this morning is, are you thirsty? I'm gonna take a drink at that. <laughs> yes, I am. The secret to revival, experiencing revival in our, in our hearts, in our homes, and in our church is thirstiness. Are you thirsty? There's a difference between being thirsty and empty. The gas tank in my vehicle this week operated mostly close to empty. I don't know how many of you are bottom half of the tank people or you just got to drive around with a full tank all the time. How many of you are bottom half of the tank, you run as close to E as you can most of the time? Yep, that would be me. So my car most of the week was on E. Friday, I took it to the gas station and I filled my tank. Listen, it was empty. But my gas tank in my car was not thirsty. Something different. It's not been, it never will be thirsty, but it was definitely empty. Being empty is a good thing. Being empty is a good thing because until we empty ourselves of ourself and of our sin, we cannot be fully yielded to uh, and surrendered to the Spirit. So if you take this as, as just an example of our life and what we fill our lives with, there's some things in here that I think just represent what we fill our life with. And as you can tell, it's mostly full. I've got a newspaper here. Some of you, you your, your life and your source and your strength of, of information and your future and your purpose comes from the news. You watch the news, you read the news, and it's like, it's so easy to let this run and rule and, and control our lives. And I'm not saying that you can't watch news, but we need to put it in perspective and put it in its rightful place. Where do you get your information from? Is this primary your information or is this? My computer. It can represent a lot of things. But we, um, we are ruled, we become ruled by social media. And we spend a lot of time with social media and we get a lot of our information from social media and they're telling us what we should and shouldn't believe, what we can and we can't do. Listen, this cannot be our source. And the amount of time that we spend on this versus, versus this, what's, what's controlling, what's filling, what's, what's ruling our lives? And I felt like Holy Spirit told me last night as, as I was just praying for this morning that that there are people, that there, there are things that happen that are happening in your life even right now through your computer that is controlling, guiding, and ruling your life. Could be an addiction. And the word that came to me was pornography. And I don't know this morning if you are struggling with that issue in your life, but I'm telling you today, what we need to do is we need to empty our lives 
and let the Spirit fill our lives. I've got my wallet here that represents money. Money can rule our lives. Things that money can buy. Our economy is changing, and as inflation goes up, it becomes more something that can be on our mind. But listen, we either believe that God can and will provide for us or not. Is God limited because the economy is, is uh, moving to inflation, hyperinflation? It doesn't change anything of what he's able to do. I believe that is, he's going to show himself in his power even greater. But we've just got we've, we've to know what's controlling our life. And here's how we need to live our life. Like this. Because listen, whatever I have in this bucket, and if I want to fill it with something else, say I had beans in the bottom of this bucket and I wanted to fill it up with corn. If I just put corn on top of what was already here, would it be filled with corn? I have to first empty in order for it to be full of whatever I want to put in here. So my question today is, what are we filling our lives with? He desires us to be empty, and he wants us to be thirsty. Thirsty for him. Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Jesus is the source. He's always been the source, always will be the source. Holiness is not the way to Jesus. Jesus is the way to live in a holy life. Revival is not the way to Jesus. Jesus is the way to revival. He said, whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within them. I want to know, have you ever been so thirsty that every thought of your mind cried out, screamed out, I need something to drink. How many of you have ever experienced that? While I talk about that, I need another drink. (laughs) I am so dry today. You've been in that situation where you've been so thirsty that it's like what consumes your thoughts and what consumes your thinking is I need water. I need something to drink. Imagine that you're in a desert and you've been in the desert for a couple of days and you haven't had a drop of water, and temperatures are, are, are reaching record highs. You've been there for two days. You're walking on this dirty, dusty path, trying to find help. You are desperately thirsty. You're seeking, you're longing. Every part of your body cries out for something to drink. Every thought is about a cold glass of water. You're so thirsty. You're desperately thirsty. And as you walk, you come around a curve and and you see a man standing on the roadside and that man is holding a pitcher, a pitcher of water. And it's one of those see-through kind of pitchers where you can see that there's ice cubes floating in this pitcher of water. And you know that it's cold because there's condensation that's that's condensing on the outside of this pitcher and it's dropping off the bottom of the pitcher. And you're looking at this, and this is the very thing that you've been searching for, that you've been longing for. And this man catches your eyes and looks right into your eyes, and he can tell that you're desperately thirsty. And he says this, you can have every bit of my water. You can have every bit of it. Imagine in that moment, imagine saying, I appreciate the offer. But I've got a lot of things on my to-do list, and I really just don't have time to drink water right now. How crazy. Or sitting down and having a theological conversation with this guy to say, uh, to, to argue about whether that water is really meant for us today or not. You're not going to do that. I promise If you're that thirsty, you're not going to do that. You're going to see water and you're going to say, if you're offering that to me, give me everything that you have because you're desperately thirsty. You know that you're going to die unless you consume and take that water, every bit of it. And so you reach out, you take it, you drink the water knowing that it's going to satisfy you and it's going to give you what you need to continue to live. Jesus is saying to every one of us, all who are thirsty, Come to me and drink. I've got something that will satisfy you and change your life forever. Rivers, rivers of living water. Not a trickle, not a stream. Rivers of living water. Ezekiel speaks of a prophetic river that brings life and power. And I want to read for you in Ezekiel chapter 47. I don't know if you've read this before. But listen as, as, this, as this picture is painted for us. 
The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple south of the altar and then he brought me out through the north gate and led me around to the outside of the outer gate facing east and the water was trickling from the south side. And as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, which is about 1,700 feet. And then he led me through water that was ankle deep. And he measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. And he measured off another thousand and he led me through water that was up to the waist. And he measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was so deep, deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. And he asked me, son of man, do you see this? And then he led me back to the bank of the river. And when I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. And he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the Dead Sea. And when it empties into the sea, the salt water there becomes fresh. Some of you have been to Israel. You've been to the Dead Sea. Some of you have been in the Dead Sea, the most saltiest body of water in the face of earth. I think it's something like 30% salt where the average ocean water is 6%. I had an experience being in the Dead Sea where water got in my eye and my eye literally started contracting and I could not open it. It it was so painful. There's nothing that lives in the Dead Sea. There's no fish, there's no fishermen. It is dead, it's the Dead Sea for a reason. So when it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Verse 9, swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will, be, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to Englim. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month there will be fruit. They will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. This man gets off of the banks and he comes down to the river and begins to measure the river first to the ankles, then to the knees, then to the waist, and then so deep that all you could do is swim in this water, this fresh water that is bringing life A river so deep that you can swim in it. John refers to this river in Revelation chapter 22. He says, the angel showed me the river, the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the land down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of nation. Listen, this river is alive. It brings life to dry places. It brings life to dead places. This morning, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to, to, to come. I believe that God wants to, to meet those who feel dry. Those who say, my life is so dry spiritually. Some of you are feeling like it's, your life is like nearly dead spiritually. Ask him where God, where is, where, where is God's spirit? Where is his presence? I feel so dry. Some of you are are needing God to to work in your life. Listen, we've had miracles that have happened in the last few weeks. People have been healed. Nancy Hansen walked in right here. Praise God. God's touched her life and his healing, and he's doing that in many, many other people's lives. We're going to pray. You see, a lot of people feel more comfortable on the bank where they can watch and observe and experience from a distance, but there is a big difference from being in the banks to being in the river. I'll tell you a story about me being a, a teenager and when I was in high school, my family moved to Oklahoma. And while I, while I lived in this area, we went to a church from the time I was about in fourth or fifth grade till I was a freshman in high school. And this church was one of those churches, great teaching, I, I learned a lot there, but it was one of the churches where Holy Spirit was just left in the corner. And my family moved to Oklahoma in a small town outside of Tulsa, and my family started attending an Assembly of God church. And if you want to know a a Pentecostal church, by the definition that I gave you earlier, this was it. They were were tongue-talking. They were pew-hopping. They were holy-rolling kind of people. And I'm telling you that as I experienced this, this kind of Christianity, I sat in those services with my eyes about this wide. 
watching and observing everything. And it seemed so real, but I, it, inside of me was like, God, is this, is this you? I'm just a 15-year-old young man. And I'm thinking, God, I want all that you have, but I'm not, I'm not so sure about this. Months went by, and I just sat back and watched. We had a service, uh, a week of services, and we had an evangelist there. And, and one particular night, he had called people forward, and almost everybody went forward for this altar call. And I sat back in the back, three rows from the back, and I sat there with my head down thinking and praying this prayer, God, if, you're, if this is you and it's real, I need, you to, I need you to prove it to me somehow. Show me. And I heard a voice on the, on the microphone talking, and I realized that this evangelist was standing about six feet away from me. He'd walked to the back row where I was sitting in the back of the sanctuary, and he pointed his finger at me and said, young man, you've been sitting back on the edge, watching, wondering if this is really real. And I just came undone. I'm like, how does this guy know what I'm thinking? Because I haven't told anybody. Somebody that didn't even know me began reading my mail. Nothing happened that night, and weeks and months went by. And I remember sitting in church service on a Sunday night, and I'd been telling God, if, you, if, if there's more for me, I, I want more. I just, I'm, I'm a little, you know, just guarded. And I remember sitting down in a Sunday night service, and I prayed this prayer as people were, were getting ready for the service to start. I said, Lord, if, if you want me to have the Holy Spirit and you want to do that work in my life, I'm open. A little nervous to pray that prayer, but I said, I'll respond. And I was so relieved when the pastor started preaching a message that had nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm good for another, good for another day, another week. And I'm, I'm telling you the truth. He got done with that message Sunday night, probably 50, 60 people in church, and the first words out of his mouth, and he said, everybody bow your heads, close your eyes. Tonight, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, it's just like something came over me. I stood up and walked to the front without him saying anything. I thought, God, you're speaking to me. And I had an experience that night with the Holy Spirit like I can't even put it into words. This rivers of living water that felt like it just came up and I felt like so lost in the presence of God. I was there for two hours praying that felt like five minutes. And that experience has changed my life forever. I got done at that altar and I felt so full of power. I felt so full of love. I just wanted to hug everybody and I was like, I don't know what to do. I just, you know, two hours of just praying, praying with my guts out is what I was doing. And I had so much energy and I felt so much strength. I'm like, I don't know what to do with myself. I fell on the floor and started doing push-ups because I didn't know what else to do. But I wanted to, I loved everybody and I wanted to tell everybody what God had done in my life. Listen, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be witnesses. An experience with the Holy Spirit is life-changing, but it's a very normal experience. We have it right here in Scripture. Is your heart open? Are you thirsty? I wanna invite you to stand with me this morning. I invite the musicians to come. I wanna ask you to respond this morning, physically, by just coming forward. If there, if, if today you're feeling very spiritually dry, or if you're feeling spiritually dead, Holy Spirit will meet you right here. I invite you to come. I invite you to come and just be in his presence. Listen, it, it's not gonna be a two hour altar call because we got church coming up in about a half an hour. But I want us to respond today just to the Holy Spirit, to his leading. If you have a need in your life, maybe you need healing, you need a touch from the Lord, I'm gonna ask you to come. And I want you to come. Uh, if you need prayer for something, I want you to come right here in front of these two sections. If you just wanna come and be in the presence and meet the, meet the Lord here, I invite you to come and stand along the sides. But would you respond today? Let me pray and then we're just gonna ask you to move. Father, in Jesus' name, by the Holy Spirit, would you speak into our hearts and those of you who are drawing, those of you who are speaking to, who want more of you, who are thirsty, who are hungry, who are just looking for water, looking for something. God, would you meet us here by your spirit in this place? In Jesus' name, amen. Would you just come? We're gonna spend just a few minutes and just ask. The Bible said if a good father knows how to give good gifts to his children, how much more does the Holy Spirit wanna give 
How much more does God want to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Let's come and meet the Holy Spirit. Would you just step out and come find a place if you need prayer right here in the middle? Lord, we pray the bread of life and the water of life pour over our lives and be our source and be our strength. Today I pray that you fill us of spiritual hungriness, of spiritual thirstiness. You said in your word that if anyone is thirsty, to come to you. And out of us will flow rivers, rivers of living water. Holy Spirit, pour your spirit on us, your presence, your power. Fill us, use us, help us. We need you. We want to be a church that experiences all that you have for us so that we can be the normal church that you want us to be. Forgive us for our lacking in the places where we haven't trusted you, but God, I pray that we would lean on you and trust in you and let your spirit guide us and lead us and fill us and empower us to accomplish all that you designed us and created us for. Let us be a Holy Spirit church filled with your spirit, your presence, your power. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We need to be thirsty, and we know where to find water. It's not, it's not just wander in the desert. Let's lead, let him lead us to water, this Holy Spirit. We want to be a Holy Spirit church.